The goalie. Goalie? Yeah. What do you want? No. Oh, oh, yeah, where's the computer? Where's the show computer? Uh, I think Moshe took it to the to the show. Oh, okay, good. He did something there. Okay. He took those ugly Yeah, beautiful, yeah. No, now it looks like one of those stunning chandeliers. Yeah, it's just serious. Wow, it's beautiful. <laughs> That's funny, but I hope we can give the thing back. We should call them right away. Yeah, find them. I don't have, I don't have their, I can't find the receipt. I have, I have the, we have it on the credit card, I'm sure. But do you know what it's called at least? But they have our name. Do you know what it's called at least? I'm going to have to look for stuff I don't know right now. Yeah. Can I come into your Zoom? Yeah, sure, sure you can. <laughs> does, it say, does it say that I'm waiting to be let in? Yeah, yeah, you're in. Oh, okay, thanks. Morning, Rabbi. Morning, morning. How's everyone doing? We all okay? Yep. Okay. How's, how's Sonia doing? Uh, she's been having a lot of pain, but uh, yeah, they're trying to manage. Oh, okay. Wish her, wish her a full shlame for me. Nice to, see, nice to see Kim from Chabad Markham. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Very nice, everybody. Just give me another minute or so. Let's get started. It's ready. Oh, it's already. Good morning, Rabbi. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Wish everybody, wish everybody a good day and good health. To one more. To the Rabbi. Okay. One second. Okay. Okay, just give me another minute here. Try to get this one here. Okay, so give me a thumbs up if you uh, give me a thumbs up. If you can hear me. Okay, very good, excellent. You can hear me. Okay, in the office again today. Stuff going on in the house. I'm here. 
Um, okay. Very good. So we're going to talk today. We continue our, our discussions on marriage and whether you're married or not, whether you once were married or whether you, the concepts are still ideas that are applicable to everyone, might be applicable to us, to our children, to our friends. You know, so it's, it's a lot of things, a lot of concepts in marriage that, that really is, is all of uh, creation. And one of the things we're going to discuss today is uh, one of the very important aspects of, of the chuppah. And we're speaking, we're speaking now about the Kabbalah of the chuppah. Is that the Talmud, it, it, it tells us that there are three ways that a marriage is consummated. One is through the gifts, the kesef, by giving each other a gift. The Talmud says, Bishtar, which is the ketubah, the commitment that we commit to each other contractually. So we, we sort of make a, we make a transaction through giving gifts, through, through the man giving the ring to the, to the woman under the chuppah. The second way is through the ketubah, which is contractual agreement. And the third aspect, which the Gemara, the Talmud speaks about, is the bia, through intimacy. Um, this is also hinted in the in the chuppah. The chuppah is is considered like the home, which is open on all sides, and and it's like the man bringing in the, the woman into his house and creating a home, which alludes to the concept of the intimacy. Later on, we also have the the yichud, which we spoke about, where they go into a private room. Nothing has to happen. No intimacy happens in the room, but it, it's a preparation again for being together in, in a state where you can ultimately come to intimacy. And hopefully when the young couple gets home, uh, they, they will consecrate the marriage in the third way of consecrating the marriage, which is through the act of intimacy. Now we know that the very beginning of the Torah, the Torah tells us about the importance of, um, of marriage. And the Torah says that uh, Adam was was all, God saw that Adam was all alone and he was lonely. So God said, Lotov, it's no good for a man to be alone. Lotov, it's no good. You know, everything until then in the creation, God said, on the first day, he said, let there be light. And he says, and God saw that it was good. On the second day, God said, let's make a sky. And he said, oh, that's good. It's very good good the third day he said let's let's make a, 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 a vegetation he said that's very good fourth day he said let's put the, the 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 sun and the moon in place very good good fifth day he said let's make the 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 the, the, uh, the uh, birds and the and, and the the fish good good again good every day good on the fourth on the sixth day he said it's very good he created the animals and then he created the afternoon he created man and he says, very good. But then he said, ah, no, 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 no. Loitoif. Something in this creation is incomplete. It's no good. What's no good? No good to be man to be alone. And therefore it says, God, what did God do? God created the woman. And uh, in the two accounts of creation, one account, just that he created the man and the woman, or he, he created the woman from the rib of man. Or they were like Siamese twins and God cut them in half, regardless of how we understand the story. The Torah tells us, therefore, a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave unto woman, and they shall become one flesh. Uh, we've discussed this, I think, many times throughout the class. And that you know, today especially, we see the concept of being alone as loitoiv. Loneliness is not a good thing. It's the only thing the Torah described is not good. In the olden days, a prisoner, you wanted to give him the worst punishment was you put them in solitary confinement. That was considered the worst punishment. Why? Because no good. Being alone is not a good thing. Right? It's never good to have a person to be alone. And in the recent years, the last two years, if we found out something, something really out of out of order, the world is 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 really everything is falling apart in the world because man 
and women, everybody, we're all alone. We're all alone. Not a good thing. You know, recently, uh, you know, there was a lot of the uh, South Africans that went to, went to South Africa, you know, after two years of being separated from their parents. So many of them, they had a little window of time to decide they're going to go see an old mother, 98 years old, 95, 92, a father or a mother, visit somebody, you know. And many of them went there and then they had to plan to come back. Vayave Omicron. Omicron was developed on another form of, of, of the COVID virus, another one of these mutations that morphed into something very fast spreading. It's driving everybody crazy now. So they found out that South Africa discovered it. So right away, they closed the borders to South Africa. So there would be South Africans that came. They found a way to get through Frankfurt and to come to, they come here, solitary confinement. They put them in hotels and they all have to sit, you know, so some people are couples, it's not so bad. The single people had to be all alone. I know someone in our community, she just lost a, a sister. She was there, very, very tragic and sad. She comes back, she has to sit alone for a week in, 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 the, in, the, in, 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 a, in a hotel. Just to wait till they get a test. And then after the test, they still left, they still left you know, three days. It's a whole, whole story. But the people that are there, I'm calling a few of the people and they're telling me the worst thing is not the, you know, it's nice rooms, the rooms are okay. But it's like the, the confinement, and the, the loneliness. You know, it's the worst thing, the loneliness. You know? So this is, this is part of what marriage is about. It's to solve the loneliness. God saw Adam was lonely. He says, ah, oh, this can't, this can't, this is not, this is not a, a, a healthy situation. Especially in the world, there was no one else. Right? It wasn't the first woman that was created was the second person. So it solved not only marriage, but it also solved loneliness. There was nothing else, right? I mean, there were animals, you know, which I guess you, you, the, a dog doesn't solve loneliness. How do you like that? You know, it's interesting. A dog is, is man's best friend. And somehow loneliness attachment, it doesn't, it doesn't really solve completely. You need another human being to attach to. Spouse, friend people you know in the last hundred years there's been a big revolution in, in human psychology one of the first uh, great psychologists of the, the last century was a fellow named Sigmund Freud you ever heard of him the guy Sigmund Freud yeah a Jewish boy from Vienna so he came up with a lot of a lot of new ideas in psychology, and today's psychology is mostly built on Freud. But Freud's idea of, of the he said that the, the strongest human drive is the sexual drive. So he said that's the strongest drive. So when they when the psychologists deal with people, they have to deal with that aspect of it. People are sexually happy, satisfied, etc. That that's very important in understanding the psyche of the human. So he, he said, that's the strongest driver, man. Then there was another fellow, also around the same time, as a fellow named Adler, also another uh, Jewish, I believe, Jewish uh, psychologist. And he, he disagreed with Freud. He said, no, no, the greatest human force the drive is, is power. To have power over others. To, you know, that's, that's really what, what drives us, the ego, to, to, you know, to be in control control of our own lives, control of others. That's what really people, that's what drives, that's the greatest human drive is to, is to amass fame and power and you know, to be, be on top of everyone. That's what he said, you know, malchut, to be a, a king, kingship, you know, that's, that's the strongest drive. And then there was another guy. So that's, that's there was a Adler, I mean, Alfred, Alfred Adler was his first name, I think so. Second, the third fellow that also around the same era, also a student of Freud, was another, another, another very famous psychologist of the last century. His name was Frank Frankel, Viktor Frankl. And Viktor Frankl, he lived through the Holocaust. And as a result of his experiences in the Holocaust, he revamped the whole philosophy, the whole psychology of, of uh, he, he disagreed with his, with his teacher. Sigmund Freud, 
who said the strongest drive was the uh, was the sexual. He also disagreed with, with Frank with uh, with Adler that it's the power. He said uh, the strongest drive within the human being is the search for meaning. And he wrote a whole book on search for meaning, and it's based on his experiences in the Holocaust. And he wrote, a, he wrote, he created a whole new psychology called logotherapy, which is a very, very helpful therapy for people from, uh, that suffer from cancer and other life-threatening you know, illnesses. It's, it's actually, it's a very good read. And he writes that in the Holocaust, he discovered that people that had a, 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 a meaning to their life, they had a purpose in, in, their, in their existence whether they were hoping to be reunited with their families, with their children, with their spouses after the war, or they had some religious values, belief in God, people that had a meaning to their life and had a reason to, something to live for, um, they were able to survive the Holocaust much better than those that didn't have. He, he pointed to the fact that there were many strong people that died in the in the Holocaust and, and, and people that, that some many of them committed suicide. Uh, they, they couldn't last the, the 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 pressures of the Holocaust because they didn't have that that that. It they, they, there wasn't something for them to live for, and they thought it's all over. And once they gave up on life and they gave up on searching for meaning, they, they couldn't exist. Those that had a search for meaning, those that believed in meaning and values of life. They were able to uh, to live through the Holocaust, and so he created this whole idea. But his his theory is that the strongest um, drive within the human being is their search for meaning. Right, for, for it's, it could be defined as you know a purpose, a purposeful existence. But then in recent times, there is a fourth um, school of psychology that emerged, also a very powerful one, really tied to all the others, but it's a different twist. In the early 1900s, there was a fellow named John Bowlby who claimed that, that psychologically, the strongest human drive is the need for attachment. And he made many experiments on monkeys and children about how, how a little child needs the mother. And by the time a child is born, he needs to hug the mother. Right? And, and from the moment someone is born, they immediately have that drive, that need for attachment. And that's the strongest force within the human being. In the last 10, 20, 30 years, there are some other modern psychologists some very famous Canadian ones that have built on that concept of the, 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 the need for attachment. And then that is actually uh, the, the strongest thing. There's a lady who uh, lives in Canada, her name is Sue Johnson. You can read her, her, her writings, excellent stuff. It's, it's very popular. And uh, she writes a lot about uh, Bowlby's uh, idea at, at the beginning of the 1900s. <laughs> That, that his studies and all of that about the need for, for attachment, human attachment, that is, right? Human attachment, but all sorts of attachment, very important. And so uh, the need for attachment and intimacy is like built in, as we see God said right at the beginning of creation, no good for the human being to alone, be alone. We need, to be, we need connectedness, right? We need to connect. We need to attach. And like I say, the last two years has, has been an experiment in that. And you see how many people are depressed and sad because they don't have that attachment. Maybe Zoom can help a little bit, you know. <laughs> Zoom is, is, is a form of attachment, I guess, but you know, you can't really, you know, <laughs> you can't, we can't really like, you know, embrace on, on the Zoom. Because uh, you know it's, it's it's virtual, it's virtual attachment. I guess I guess that's worth something, some kind of attachment. But it's not it's not really a real attachment. 
So the need for attachment and intimacy amongst people is, is, is very, very built in. It's very, very, it's ingrained in who we are. And so the very beginning of creation, Hashem says, and that's what the chuppah is about. The chuppah celebrates the uh, eventual intimacy of the bride and the groom. Chas and Kala. They won't be lonely anymore and they will become, as the Torah says, that therefore man shall leave their father and mother and cleave unto each other and become one flesh. If you recall, we said the one flesh has two interpretations. One means that they hug it, they come close to each other. And like Adam and Eve, they were once one body. Eve was the rib of Adam, right? She came from that, or, or they were Siamese twins, right? So they, they come back together again. So, the, so God created us with a void, with an emptiness that needs to be filled. We need that attachment. And if we don't have it, we feel like we're missing something in our lives. Right? And so that's one interpretation of there should be one flesh means they shall come together in an act of intimacy. The other one is, is they shall be one flesh means that the child that comes as a result of the act of intimacy, God in his infinite wisdom created a possibility to create another human being that comes as a result of love, which further entrenches the concept of attachment that the entire human being in this, every human being was created in this world through an act of attachment. Think about that for a moment. How attachment is, 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 is embedded in our DNA. It's part of who we are. We are all created by an act of attachment. So that means our whole existence came through attachment. That's why attachment is, is like, we need it so badly. You're going to ask me about test two babies. Uh, I don't know. No. <laughs> there goes my whole idea. Test two babies, but, you know, I guess test two babies is exception to the rule. I guess the, 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 the sperm and the egg need to have attachment. So there still is some form of attachment. <laughs> it might not be the physical, physical attachment, but there's two physical things that have to attach. They attach themselves to each other, right? The sperm has to attach itself to the egg. But maybe I'm going too far with this idea. Maybe, perhaps. Who knows? Who knows? But the idea is like, like, that's who we are. We are people that need attachment. And that's why what's part of what the FUPA celebrates. You bring the bride and groom on the one roof, on the one seat, and then later take them a private room all as a preparation to the third aspect of what the Talmud says, that, that they are they acquire each other through the act of intimacy. Bebiya. That, that's the act, of, the act of intimacy which was created. So that this is why, like, these days, we're dealing with with a lot of psychological problems. People people lacking uh, connection, intimacy. People don't even shake hands. You know, we used to take shaking hands as as a uh, we took it for granted. But what was the last time you shook someone's hand? <laughs> you know, stranger. What was the last time you shook someone's hand? You do. People do like the uh, the knuckle uh, you know thing. Or, elbow or they do they do all kinds of uh, weird ways of connecting but a handshake as you know i used to like on a on, on a on a yontif on the rosh Hashanah, i used to shake like you know 500 people's hands and by the time i was finished my hand was like you know and there's always one person in the shul that shakes your hand and they, yeah, and they have a real <laughs> I go after with my hand, like my hand is like, you know, because there's always that one person. But handshake is also a very, very important uh, form of. Uh... So here we have, we have the, the, uh, the it's, it's called, it's called the uh, fifth love language. It's touch and intimacy. 
Um, in the book, The Five Love Languages, uh, they speak about the different languages that people need. And one of them, one of them actually is touch and intimacy. That is one of the important things that to, to, to perpetuate love, we need to fill our love tanks with, with, with a sufficient amount of, of, of uh, touch and intimacy. For some people, that's very, very important, touch. You know, you go, you go like there's some children that they found that they, uh, they don't grow up so well because they, they weren't touched by their parents. They weren't hugged by their parents enough. Uh, it's an interesting thing that in some in some homes, the very very touchy feeling uh, families, and other homes, uh, you know, people are like you know like maybe more uh, uh, you know German, Austria, and those kind of places of the world. There's not a lot of touching going on. You know, it's like more, it's like you know, you you, you nod. Some families, you walk in, everybody hugging and kissing each other. You walk through the door; it's like a whole, a whole to do, right? In other homes, you walk, you everybody, everybody goes, everybody says hello, <laughs> just nod, right? It's, it's a different, it's a different upbringing, huh? Sometimes that that becomes a problem when I when I uh, counsel sometimes married couples. Sometimes that that is that is one of the issues. One person, you know, childhood influences is a big thing. So one child comes, one, one, one bride or groom, whatever, they come from a family that, that maybe they, uh, they hugged a lot and that was the, the way of life. And the other family, it's like everybody is, you know, removed. It's not that they love each other less, it's just a way, a way of life, right? And then when those th that couple comes together, they don't realize that that, that is the problem. They're expecting uh, a lot of hugging, and caressing. And, you know, and if they don't receive that, they feel unloved. And then the other, the other spouse or whatever might, you know, they, they don't like, they find it, it's like, it's invading my privacy. Every time you always have to hold my hand, you have to hug me. It's like invading my space, you know, just like take it easy a little bit, you know, don't, don't, <laughs> don't, don't like, you know, don't take away my, my breathing space. And then so they don't want, you know, and that sometimes is, is, a, is a, a source of friction among couples, I find many times. Because, you know, couples need to talk to each other to, to discuss what their, what their background is. And what the expectations are. What the expectations are. Obviously, there has to be intimacy for everybody. But just the day-to-day -day life, the amount of, of that, the amount of attachment, you know, is, that is expected. And, and you know, so that sometimes that is, that's important to talk to each other about, you know. In Judaism, in fact, in the way a marriage is structured according to the Torah, it's quite an interesting thing. The Torah encourages, obviously, to, to be intimate and not to be alone. But in Jewish life and Jewish law, when the, when the woman goes through a, a, a menstrual period, uh, intimacy is forbidden. According to the Torah. It's like a, a violation of the Torah law. And according to rabbinic law, an entire week after the, uh, the, uh, the period is over, which means in total it could be close to two weeks of separation between the husband and wife. And only after the two weeks does the woman go to the mikveh and then marital relations are resumed. Which is a, quite an interesting uh, concept. So in Judaism, there is the... the uh, for a half a month, there is very close relations. And for the other half of the month, it's, it's also like that, that yucky relationship, you know, where you have the, the uh, you know, just nod, hello, how are you? I always tell people when I teach, when I teach the laws of marriage, according to the Torah, you know, I always tell them that, you know, the Torah actually encourages 
to have some time of attachment and then some time of, of, uh, of separation. And that absence makes the heart grow fonder. That's the way the Torah sees it. Because sometimes if you smother someone too much, they, 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 there's, there's an opposite reaction. So the Torah has sort of a cycle, a monthly cycle. I remember Goldie once taught it to a bride. Uh, she, taught, she taught the laws of family purity to the bride. And, and you know, a you know, modern bride, she was rolling her eyes at this whole idea because you know, a lot of people, even many Jews, they don't observe it. They don't know these, these laws. Um, but we do, we do actually encourage it as part of uh, not, just, uh, not just religious law, but also marital counseling. But... She, Goli told it this one bride, and the bride was like rolling her eyes and giving go like, oh, yeah, what do you mean, two weeks off? I can't do that. And she comes, she comes the next day, next uh, next week back to the class, and she's very, uh, you know, very engaged in the class. So Goldie happened like, well, I don't understand what what happened. Like, why are you suddenly like interested in this whole thing? And last week you were like rolling your eyes. She says, you you know what happened last week? I came home. You know, my fiance, he's a very, very famous uh, psych psychologist, psychiatrist. He works in, in the uh, Cam H downtown. And when I came home, he asked me, what, what, what did you learn? She says, oh, I told my, my fiance, I said, you won't believe what I heard. I heard that Judaism says that it should be two weeks on, two weeks off. Two weeks to engage in relations and intimacy, and two weeks take a little break. He says, what? The Torah says that? He says, I, I thought it was my own idea. He says, when I have clients that have problems with the, with the marriage, I always recommend that. And it works like a charm. I tell them exactly that. Two weeks on, two weeks off. That's my, uh, I thought it was my idea. He said, the Torah says that? And I said, <laughs> she, the girl says to Goldie, like, I, I couldn't believe it. my husband said that that's like a, like, like a normal thing. And that's, that's a great idea. And it's actually helpful for marriage. So, so she said, well, I'm, not, I'm in, I'm in. <laughs> tell me more about this, these laws. But I, I want you to know that, that two weeks on and two weeks off doesn't work so well because, um, because when you, when is the two weeks on, when is the two weeks off? If you just pick and choose any two weeks on and two weeks off based on your, uh, you know, your, your own, uh, Decisions. So if, if it becomes something that's that's like, you know, you're just not in the mood of each other, you just say, okay, now's the two weeks off. <laughs> just stay away from here. We're making another two weeks. That doesn't work because then you're hurting the, the spouse who wants to be together with you. But when it becomes Jewish law, so then then the thing really works because then it's not it's not it's not your own uh, uh, decision making. It's not your own uh, choice of when the time should be. God chose this time and said it should be around the time of the period. So that's, that, that's like a law. So neither spouse can hold it against each other that they're separating from each other. And that's why it works well. So besides for the Torah's wisdom, the Torah's uh, spiritual side of it, there also is a practical side to it. But uh, so within intimacy itself, within attachment. Sometimes, you know, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Not like COVID that's for two years of separation. <laughs> that, that's, that's unbearable, but sometimes it, it, you know, it's good to have a little bit on and off within the context of, of attachment and realizing how important attachment is and having attachment. You know? So sometimes, like you know, like I say, absence makes the great the heart grow fonder. So it's good sometimes even with friends. And friends, let's say, get to not be with each other too much. Sometimes that you know that's also not good. You need to take a break from each other a little bit, which is a fair thing, because you get on each other's nerves when you get too close with each other. So within the context of the, the chupa, we have this idea of of, of uh, attachment, intimacy, touch. But also Judaism allows for some kind of a, a break. And, and, and what, what do you do in the, within that break? Then, then it's more of a platonic relationship. You know? So you, you can talk to each other ideas. Right? 
sometimes touch can get in the way of ideas. You know, when it's when it's just, you know, only 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 attachment. Sometimes that's not good. It's good to just sit, and discuss things, right? And to attach that way on an intellectual level. So that's that's an important important. So here we have the, the uh, fifth language, the fifth love language, that's that's uh, uh, re- that's brought into the chuppah, and that is that is the other the other form of, of intimacy, and uh, the other form of, of uh, other aspect of the mystical side of what the the chuppah is all about. It's about two souls, two bodies coming together, breaking the loneliness, which the Torah uh, recommends. And then becoming one flesh. And that spurs on the love to each other for a lifetime of love. Uh, so I hope I cover this subject a little bit today. I hope you had a good time. And if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to ask. Any questions, any comments? Or... Yeah, I do, Rabbi. Okay, Sonia, go ahead. Um, I remember when I was growing up, my mother um, lived in a shtetl in eastern uh, Czechoslovakia, Slovakia, which was Austro-Hungarian monarchy. Right, uh, I, I, I land or whatever. Huh? Yes, yeah. and um, and she told me that um, uh, it was absolutely necessary uh, a week before uh, the chupe, yeah. the groom and the bride were not allowed to see each other. Okay. And she was telling me stories about her mother uh, right. doing the right. same thing. Right. Where right. this come from? And apparently the whole shtetl, everybody was watching for it. And they were very careful so they don't even cross, uh, cross the same path. So, yeah. Yes. So, uh, be honest with you, I did the same thing too. Uh, it's still a tradition, it's still a custom, it's alive and well, that the Chos and Kala separate themselves for seven days before the marriage. Like the Kohen Gadol, before he went into the Holy of Holies, he would also separate from his wife for the week. Uh, so it's like a concept of seven days of preparation, uh, also to create that magic under the chuppah when they see each other. If they're not seeing each other for seven days, you know, like like when they see the, that moment becomes very very sanctified, it becomes very special when that when that happens. In general, when, when the chos and kala see each other for the first time under the chuppah or by the badeking when they see each other, it's always a magical moment. But this this intensifies it even more. In some communities, they do it the entire seven days. Others, they do it from Shabbos on. And in other communities, they do it at least the day before the wedding, that they don't see each other. Now, this was a very, very strong custom till the photographers got involved. <laughs> they, they destroyed this whole custom badly, like, you know, because the photographers need the whole day to take pictures. So in the very religious community, like in our community, we, uh, we don't, we take all the pictures Besides for the pictures of the bride and groom together before the wedding. And then after the chuppah, between the chuppah and the, and the, uh, and the dancing, uh, they, they, that's when they take the pictures of the bride and groom. But it gets complicated. You want to take also with the family, with the bride and the groom, and then it becomes like a balagan. That's why in a lot of the religious weddings, you see the bride and the groom, they come in like, uh, like an hour or two later, maybe by the third course, <laughs> they only come in. Why? Because they're taking all the pictures that they couldn't take before because they didn't see each other before. But in, in most of the Jewish community today, the, 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 where the uh, photographers reign supreme and they run the wedding more or less, so they broke that thing. Because I know a lot of people, before there were pictures, they used to at least a day before, or two days before, or the week before, they wouldn't see each other. But now that, that's, that's, become a little bit, that's become a little weakened. But again, this is, this is not halacha, it's a minag. It's a custom. Okay. You know, the laws of family purity, which I mentioned before, that's more of a din. That's that's actually in the Torah. Right? The, the, not seeing each other for seven days is, is, is a is a good, important custom, but it's a custom, so it's not like it's not like the end of the world. So, so. Okay, Rabbi, I was um, surprised that all the um, North American movies, the old movies, um, I thought it was taken custom from the Judaism. They um, always um, were saying. You are not supposed to see the groom's wedding gown before the wedding. So I thought that they changed, uh, um, you know, those seven days because many of the directors were Jewish people um, right. in the 30s. So at least they 
insert it into the movie that the groom is not allowed to see for a few days prior to the wedding, the wedding gown. It, it just could, could be, could be this, that's the source of it. I, was, I wasn't aware of this very important custom not looking at the wedding gown, but <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe that's where it comes from. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thanks very much. Good job, good job everybody. Thank you. Thank see you. you. See you. All the best. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye.